For Norwegian Roald Amundsen, failure was not an option. Already famous for sailing through the Northwest Passage from the Canadian Arctic to the Pacific, that victory was not enough. Amundsen began planning an expedition to the North Pole, and in 1907 he asked his idol, Fritjof Nansen, if he could borrow from the ship that Nansen had taken into the Arctic. Unlike other boats, Fram would respond to sideways pressure by being pushed upwards, rising out of the pack to sit above the ice. Amundsen planned and calculated every aspect of the expedition with only the vision of success in mind. In 1909, he was completing his plans to drift to the North Pole in the ice pack when the news was broadcast across the world. The North Pole is reached. The American commander Robert Peary had reached it by dog sled. Why would he want to go north now? Even if he reached the North Pole, there would be no prize in coming second. There was only one trophy left, the South Pole. At once, Amundsen switched targets and began to plan for a trip south, though he never told anyone except for two or three of his closest associates. Even Nansen wasn't told. Shackleton had reached within a hundred miles of it the year before. Robert Scott was preparing for another attempt. The urge to tell Nansen must have been immense, but what if Nansen refused to land Fram for a journey that he himself was preparing to travel? Amundsen chose not to take the risk. Fram left the Oslo Fjord on 7th of June 1910. Before she sailed, the King and Queen of Norway visited her, carrying the hopes of so many Norwegians. Nansen watched him sail away from the quay with Amundsen on the bridge. Despite his kindness, he said it was the bitterest hour of my life. As far as everyone knew, Amundsen was starting another Arctic expedition. Only four of his crew knew the truth. Amundsen himself, his second-in-command, Captain Nilsen, and the two first officers, one of whom was Lieutenant Prestrud. In Madeira, Amundsen revealed the truth. He was travelling south, not north. His goal was the South Pole. He even sent a cable to Captain Scott in Melbourne. It read simply, I'm going south. Stop. Amundsen, stop. The race was on. In January 1911, Amundsen and his crew disembarked the Fram on the Ross Ice Barrier, now called the Ross Ice Shelf, 788 miles from the South Pole. In this, Amundsen was taking a huge risk. Unlike Scott, who was heading along a route already attempted by Shackleton, Amundsen planned to beat him by venturing into the unknown. Another difference between the two explorers was their chosen draft animals. Scott chose ponies. Amundsen chose Greenland Eskimo dogs. He calculated that besides speed, dogs had other advantages. Beyond the Ross Ice Barrier was a range of mountains rising to more than 10,000 feet that dogs could climb and ponies could not. There was another important factor. Each dog was a mobile store of fresh meat to be killed and eaten when the time came. To Amundsen, the strategist, the planner, there was nothing cruel in the idea of slaughtering the weakest animals to provide fresh food for the remainder and the men. But there wasn't a man who was not revolted by the prospect of shooting the dogs. How close to the ship Amundsen could erect their base on the ice barrier was critical. Too close to the sea and the shelf ice would carve and drift away. Too far away and they would lose precious time transporting supplies to the camp, the Framheim the village under the ice. Yet Amundsen had planned for this, and his judgment on where to set up camp proved correct. He planned to set out for the pole in September, as soon as spring came. There was no risk that Scott could set off before that. By the 27th of August, they were ready to start on the last 788 miles of the long journey. The men were healthy, Amundsen, with his capacity for attention to detail that so often marks the difference between success and failure, had calculated what types and quantities of food would be necessary. After 15 miles, however, bad weather forced him to return to camp. The temperature fell from 8 degrees centigrade to below 49 degrees centigrade. 
The breath of men and dogs freezes the moment it hits the air, wrote Amundsen. After the false start, Amundsen waited a month before leaving with a smaller party. Along with four sleds, he took Bjorland, Hussel, Wisting and Hansen. The dogs were magnificent, wrote Amundsen, twisting and turning their way through the mountains across a maze of crevasses. There were steep descents to negotiate as well as climbs. The drops were sometimes terrifying. In four days, Amundsen had brought the whole expedition up 11,000 feet of frozen rock and ice, sleds, dogs and men. They estimated they were six days ahead of schedule and would have believed they had a very real chance to beating Scott. They made camp on 20th of November at a place that Amundsen had named Butchers. This was where they were going to kill the dogs. After shooting the 24 weakest dogs, they abandoned one of the sleds and divided the remaining 18 dogs into three teams of six. But just as they were about to depart, the weather turned. The wind transformed the snow into a solid, blinding wall. There was no chance of getting through. They sat in the tent for four days. On the fifth day, they could no longer bear the delay. They agreed that it was better to brave the blizzard and make even just a little progress rather than stay put. The wind roared, piercing the skin through cracks in their clothes. The dogs were covered in snow and refused to move. When they did finally set forth, the whole plain ahead was a blanket of drifting snow that covered everything in its path. It was sheer madness, said Amundsen. We were running blind over unknown ground. I was afraid we might fall into a chasm before we could pull up. On 8th of December, they arrived at the farthest point reached by Shackleton three years earlier. Latitude 88 degrees, 23 minutes south. No one had ventured beyond. No other moment on the whole journey moved me as much as this, said Amundsen. The weather changed dramatically. With bright sunshine and blue skies, their spirits lifted and it all seemed to have been worth it. The painful sores on the faces, the blistered feet, none of it mattered in comparison to the incredible achievement that was now within their grasp. It was like being a boy again, said Amundsen. Their sled meters ticked off the miles, 9, 10, 11, 12, and at last 15. They paused. Could it be true? Amundsen carefully checked the meters and took sextant readings. They had arrived. At 3 p.m. on 14th of December, 1911, they had reached the South Pole. They had beaten Scott by 35 days. They each put a hand around the flagpole made of ski sticks, bearing the Norwegian flag, and pushed it into the ground. Amundsen called the area King Håkon VII Plateau, after the King of Norway. He wrote a note for Scott, asking him to give a message to the King in case he didn't survive the return journey. Along with a note, he put letters from his companions, a pair of mittens and a spare sextant in a bag and hung it inside a small tent. Scott would no doubt find them. They surely knew how hard that discovery would be. The men stood together, bareheaded, staring up at the red flag with a white cross and the blue cross over the white. Then they turned north again for their camp, Framheim. They had conquered the South Pole. They had done this for Norway and also for themselves. Amundsen returned to Norway in 1913 after a stay in South America where he wrote The South Pole, his account of the expedition. Scott's party reached the Pole on 17th of January 1912, only to discover that Amundsen had beaten them to it. They began the long 1,500-kilometre journey back, but they never made it. Scott and two of his men died of starvation and exposure in their tent on the 29th of March, just 20 kilometres from a supply depot. At the time, Amundsen's monumental achievement in reaching the pole was overshadowed by the tragedy of Scott's expedition. Amundsen was regarded by some as cold and calculating. Yet it was precisely Amundsen's careful planning, calculated risks, attention to detail and need for secrecy that were the reasons for his success, notwithstanding his courage. In Amundsen's words, victory awaits him who has everything in order, luck we call it. Defeat is definitely due for him who has neglected to take the necessary precautions, bad luck we call it.